Good morning again, my beloved. Uh, I'm mean, thinking about miracles as Sam was sharing with uh, the children this morning. You know, we, we're surrounded with miracles, really, as we look around at, at creation. You know, whether it's the, the mayflies and their incredible life cycle that lasts a year and then in 24 hours, all the things that, that take place. Whether it's the butterflies that uh, go from being in a cocoon to, to bursting out and being beautiful creatures. But there's a hymn, and I, I know I'm going to get it partially wrong, but it's, uh, it was written by, I think it was William Peterson, uh, where he wrote it, took a miracle to hang the stars in space. And then uh, I think the chorus is, uh, it took a miracle, but the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of God's grace. Uh, and mercy. And like I said, it's a paraphrase. And so uh, another miracle to remember is the miracle of the new birth, uh, the work that God does in our hearts uh, through regeneration by the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and prepare our hearts for this morning's lesson. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we, we live in such an incredibly amazing world. Uh, all around us is evidence of, of your creations. And Father, we Thank you that all this came into being uh, came out of nothing, uh, that you spoke and it, it was there, uh, that there were no atoms, no molecules, no, no matter uh, for anything to be created. So you created the matter that created all these things. And Father, you created uh, the very smallest microscopic creature uh, and then the, the greater creatures. Uh, you created uh, our planet. Uh, you set it in orbit around the sun. And, and the list goes on and on. So, Father, we stand amazed uh, as we think about your creative genius and the great power that it took to bring everything into being out of nothing. And so, Father, that humbles us, but also fills us with thanks and praise and, and honor uh, for your incredible glory, well, your infinite wisdom. And, uh, and, Father, for your amazing grace that you've shown to us through the miracle of the new birth. Uh, so, Father, again, we have much to be thankful for. And, Father, as we come to your word this morning, uh, give us teachable hearts. Uh, give us understanding of the text we'll be unpacking. Uh, pray, again, that you'll be glorified and all of us will be edified and challenged uh, as we consider, continue to consider this a letter that Paul wrote to a, a man named Titus, uh, and he was told to set in order the things that remain in the churches. And Father, this morning we'll see how that all begins. Uh, so guide and direct our thoughts. Uh, again, help us to clear our mind of any distractions. And uh, Father, bring glory to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, we should be turned to, uh, to Titus chapter 1. And let's read together verses 5 through 9, but then we're going to turn most of our attention uh, to verses 6 and 7. Okay, so Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. It says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not found fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, <clears throat> loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Now, last words, ABJ introduced us to, to Titus, uh, who Paul calls with obvious affection in verse 4, by true child in a common faith. And from this greeting and other portions of Scripture, primarily 2 Corinthians, uh, we know Titus was a partner and fellow worker with Paul. Uh, he's described as being an earnest and gracious man uh, who was a comfort and encouragement uh, to others. We also saw in Galatians chapter 2, uh, we learned he was a Gentile believer who was not intimidated by false teachers, uh, but stood firmly on the sound doctrine that he had been taught by Paul. 
We also know Titus, like Timothy, uh, had been mentored and discipled by Paul, uh, traveled with him, and, and over the years had been sent to various churches where he encouraged the saints and dealt with the problems that they may have been facing. And last week we saw also in verse 5, uh, Paul, Titus's instructions from Paul. It says there, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. And from this verse, we know Paul and Titus had been involved in a joint missionary effort on the island of Crete. Uh, they had been visiting various churches that had been established in different cities. But for some unknown reason, uh, Paul left Crete before the churches were fully organized. And so he left Titus behind to, as he says, to set in order what remains, and we could add there, undone uh, in the churches and ensure that they were properly established. And as we also learned last week, the phrase set in order means to set right or arrange correctly. Uh, It implies straightening things out uh, of completing what was unfinished or deficient. And the first thing that needed to be straightened out was the appointing of elders in every city, as Paul directed Titus to do. Now, when used in this context, uh, the word appoint means to ordain. That means to set in place or put into office. So when someone is appointed an elder, they are officially installed and entrusted with the duty of carrying out what the position requires. Uh, These men were not only to be properly qualified, they must also possess the abilities required uh, to care for God's church. And a particular interest at the very beginning of our our study is that in the original language, the word elders is masculine. And the same is true of the word overseer in verse 7, which means, of course, the elders are to be men. Uh, And this is further supported in verse 6, where one of the qualifications of elders is to be the husband of one wife. But not only were the elders be men, they must be mature believers uh, who demonstrated a a good knowledge of God's word uh, and its application in their lives. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6 says he should not be a new convert, uh, that he will not become conceited and fall into condemnation incurred by the devil. And adding to this is a a warning in 1 Timothy 5.22. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourselves free from sin. What this all means is that appointing elders is a somber and serious pursuit of qualified men that is not to be taken lightly. And Titus will be the first one to appoint the elders. And then after that, the elders that have been appointed will be appointing the future elders of the particular churches. Now, before we continue, let's look just a little bit at this term elders. Uh, In scripture, the word elders is used in a a general sense for someone who is old. uh, The people that we call today the, the seniors. But in the Old Testament, elders were the leaders in the cities. Uh, They oversaw the people, uh, and they also sat as judges uh, to settle different uh, differences among the the general population. But we also know that elders were the appointed leaders in the Jewish synagogues. In the New Testament, the term elder is a title for those who lead the church. And there are several synonyms for elders, several other terms. Uh, in verse 7, and again in 1 Timothy 3, 1, they are called overseers, or your translation might have the word bishops, uh, which is defined as someone who watches over and protects others. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, elders are called pastors or, or shepherds and teachers. Uh, and they are also called shepherds or pastors in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and 1 Peter 5, 2. So when you put, combine all these titles, we learn an elder is a man appointed to oversee, to watch over, care for, protect, and defend the church. They are also shepherds uh, who lead and feed God's flock. So in a very real sense, they are both leaders, but they are also servants. 
And obviously the, the man appointed to serve the, the church in this capacity must be able to do so. Uh, thus the reason scripture gives us a list of qualifications both here in Titus chapter 1 and also in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And it should also be pointed out that there is to be appointed a plurality of elders. Uh, there is to be more than one elder serving the church. And these men will share the responsibility of shepherding God's people. And there is more, actually, when you look at this, to appointing elders than simply finding the right man. Uh, it includes the involvement and guidance, actually, of the Holy Spirit. And let me explain that just a little bit. If you look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, uh, you know, in that chapter, Paul called for the elders from the church in Ephesus. And he gave them this admonishment. He says this, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So the Holy Spirit is ultimately the, the one who makes an elder. And maybe to even build it out a little bit more, in 1 Timothy 3.1, it says, It is a trustworthy statement, to serving, a trustworthy statement if any man aspires to. Or, and that word aspires to means that if any man desires, uh, if he eagerly longs for the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. Well, that desire, that, that longing to serve as an elder comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit moves the man with the desire to serve God's people. And then adding to this, uh, in Acts chapter 14, verse 23, when Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in the church, it says, well, as they were uh, getting ready to appoint them, they, they prayed with fasting. They asked of God for guidance, and once the men were appointed, it says they commended or committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So I say all this to say that the appointing of elders involves the Holy Spirit's guidance accompanied by prayer and fasting to ensure the right men are put into positions of leadership. So having this as our background, now let's work our way through these qualifications. Uh, in verse 6, and again in verse 7, we have the overriding qualification. Verse 6, if any man is above reproach, uh, or it could be if any man uh, uh, is blameless. Verse 7, we see it a second time. The overseer must be above reproach or blameless. Now, someone who is above reproach, uh, they're free of any accusation. Uh, he has no charges uh, against him. Uh, he is beyond indictment. Uh, there is nothing in his life that can be called into question. Uh, he's not accountable for any wrongdoing. Uh, it means quite literally that the man is without stain or guiltless. Uh, there's nothing in his past or present life that would disqualify him from being a model of Christian virtues. So in short, no one can accuse him of not meeting the qualifications listed in these verses. And adding to this, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 7 says, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So being above reproach is important both in the church as well as in the community. And it's good to add here as well that this does not mean that elder is perfect. Uh, otherwise, no one would be qualified. But what it does mean is that he is spiritually, morally, and biblically qualified to be an elder. It should be evident that he is striving to be a godly man whose personal and spiritual life, as well as the lives of those in his home, is in order and that he is growing in the knowledge and, and application of God's word to his life, and also the life of his family and the life of the church. And so the, the elder, in a very real way, is going, supposed to be a man who is a model. He's to be an example to the congregation, and that is a major part of shepherding. And so let's look at just uh, several passages that, that support that. First Timothy 4.12 there Paul told Timothy this, he said, in speech, conduct, love, 
faith and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. So the elder is to be a good example in what he says and does. He's not just supposed to be just a hearer of God's word. He's to be a doer of God's word. He's a man who loves not just with his words, but also in his actions as well. And then in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, we, we have this instruction as well. Uh, Paul is talking to the church. He says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we not did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, so that you would follow our example. So the elder is to be an example of self-discipline, of hard work, of unselfishness as well. Well, Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Okay, So the elder is to be an example of someone who lives by faith, His faith should be evident to those that he serves. And then another passage, and we'll refer to this quite often during during this lesson, but in 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3, it says this. Actually, let's read from verse 1 to 3. This is Peter, and Peter is talking to the elders. He says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. And here's his instructions. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. So once again, we see that the elder is to be an example of a willing servant of God who serves others. Jesus said, I said he came to the world not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. And that is how the elder's heart is to be as well. Not to be served, but to serve. As Paul also said, I think it's in Second Corinthians where he said, I am willing to spend and be expended. For your souls. That's the heart of the shepherd as well. So back to the Titus chapter one, being above a bridge begins begins with this being the husband of one wife. Or literally this can be translated one woman's man or a one woman man. And this is also found upon among the qualifications listed in first Timothy chapter three. So the question comes up, well, how do those appointing elders in the church determine if a man is the husband of one wife, a one woman man? Well, for one thing, it's evident that the man only has eyes for his wife. Uh, He doesn't have roaming eyes. Uh, He doesn't desire to be married to anyone else. Uh, His wife is in his heart, uh, in his thoughts, in his prayers. It's obvious to everyone that his wife is the object of his utmost affection by the way that he treats her. He's a man who loves his wife as Christ loved the church. He was willing to give himself up for her. He's a man who's willing to die in his wife's place. He protects her, provides for her. And when you think of the man, you almost automatically think of his wife because his wife is a part of who he is. And uh, 1 Peter 3, 7 helps us, helps us with this. It says there, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So elder should be someone who understands his wife. 
He spent his entire marriage studying her. He knows her and treats her not only as his wife, but treats her as his sister in Christ. So the husband of one wife, the one woman out man, is he's loyal to his wife. He delights in the wife of his youth, as it says in Proverbs. Or to quote Solomon, she is his beloved. So the man sought to shepherd God's church should be models and patterns and examples to other men of marital virtue. Dedication to loving his wife as Christ loves the church that is seen in his actions and in his words. Now, though this qualification is easy enough to understand, its proper application has been a topic of discussion and debate for years, and especially in the current years in which we live. Of course, no one disagrees being the husband of one wife eliminates anyone who is a polygamist, that is, has more than one wife. That's a no-brainer there. Okay, so it eliminates that. But what about a man whose wife has died uh, and he has remarried? Is he qualified? Well, if you will, turn to, to Romans chapter 7 for a minute. Romans chapter 7, and let's look at verses 2 and, and 3. Now, speaking here about a, a married woman whose husband has died, but the application certainly would apply to a man whose wife has died. But Romans 7, 2 and 3, For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies... She is free from the law, so she is not an adulteress, so she is joined to another man. And then 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, says something very similar. It says there, a wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. And then he makes this little extra point, only in the Lord. And then later in 1 Timothy 5.14, Paul instructs young widows to get married and have children. As I just said, what applied to widows would certainly be apply to a husband whose wife just died. Therefore, a man who is remarried after his wife has died, he is above reproach. And as I point out when we, when we read in 1 Corinthians, okay, it should be added that if a Christian man remarries after the death of his wife, he should marry another Christian. He should marry someone in the Lord. If he marries an unbeliever, then he would not be qualified to serve as an elder. So that's one of the debates and discussions. But the biggest debate is over men who have been divorced and remarried. Are they qualified? Now, we know from what Jesus taught in Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, that divorce is permissible where adultery has taken place. And Matthew 19, 9 indicates in such cases, remarriage is permissible. And Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 16, that divorce is also permissible in the case of abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. Now, in that case, Paul does not say remarriage is permissible, but he does say that the husband or wife are no longer bound to the spouse who is left, which would seem to permit a remarriage. Now, when trying to apply this, some take this to mean the man who is divorced is automatically disqualified, regardless of the circumstances which tends to put divorce in the category of an unpardonable sin. Well, beloved, as you can imagine, this poses some challenges. Uh, for the appointment of elders. Uh, Questions need to be asked, such as did a divorce take place prior to salvation? Was divorce for reasons other than adultery or abandonment? What are the circumstances? Who was impacted? Were attempts at reconciliation made? Uh, Do the wife or children of a prior marriage have anything against the man that would damage his credibility or destroy his reputation and bring reproach upon him or the church. 
So the responsibility to investigate the circumstances falls on those appointing the man as the elder. Again, like I said, appointing elder is a serious business. It's not to be taken lightly. And in cases like this, doing your homework is absolutely critical. But there is something else. It doesn't stop there. And I think this really helps to, to wrap this all together. A man under consideration to become an elder or any other church leader who has been divorced and remarried should examine his own heart and actions and evaluate the circumstances of his divorce and if it would have any bearing on his becoming an elder. Back in Titus, again in verse 6 or verse 9, it says that to the elder, he is to hold fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching. And this means that the spiritual maturity and personal characteristics of a man to become an elder should be element in his own choice to allow himself to be considered to be an elder or to refuse to be considered. And if he can determine after self-examination, after prayer and all these things, that those in the Christian community as well as those in the unbelieving community Regard him as blameless, that he is is free of guilt when it comes to divorce, and therefore not compromising his witness of the church, that he may allow himself to be considered. But if, on the other hand, there is reason to believe that the church's witness would be compromised by his serving as an elder, then the man himself should not allow himself to be considered. However, that does not eliminate him from serving the Lord in other capacities within the church. And then one last question in relation is, what about single men? Uh, Being unmarried should not be considered a reason to keep a man from being an elder. Uh, In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul wrote a lot of positive things about the advantages of being single. However, the majority of candidates will probably be married and appointed elders because of their experience in marriage and raising the family. However, a single man is certainly not disqualified from serving the church as an elder. But not only are the elders to be the husband of one wife, they are to have children who believe. King James translates children who are faithful. Okay, And they're not accused of or charged with and the, the translations vary a lot here, charged with dissipation or rebellion or debauchery or insubordination, wild and disobedient living, accused of riot or unruly. Not a, not a pretty picture at all. But this qualification, like the first, has also been a topic of discussion and debate, especially over the phrase, Children who believe. So the first question he asks is, does this mean an elder's children must be saved? That they must be Christians? Well, if we say yes, then we have to ask, well, from what age? Does it mean children past the age of two? Do they have to be Christians? Or 13 or or 18? And then you face with the question, what do you do with a man who has a children, a child who is an infant? A newborn. And of course, we all know that, that salvation is not guaranteed to anyone's children. So why would it be a qualification for, for elders? Well, in this phrase, the word translated as believe is the New Testament, uh, is used in the New Testament, not only in reference to saving faith, but also to being faithful, uh, as the King James translated. And when we think about being faithful, we think of someone who is trustworthy, dependable, reliable. And I believe that best fits in the context of this verse. In other words, elders' children must be faithful. Faithful in what? Faithful to honor their parents. Not openly and profoundly rebellious, uh, disobedient children who don't bring a disgrace upon the parents. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that the elder's children must be perfect little angels. Uh, It doesn't mean that they won't do some stupid things as they are growing up. But the question is, how are they handled? Uh, How is discipline being administered? 
what kind of encouragement is being given to them. It also doesn't mean that, that children who have left the home and have become adults and are outside the elders' control, that they must all be outstanding believers, have nothing wrong in their lives. But when children are in the elders' home, there must be evidence of his spiritual influence on them and control over their behavior. First well, Timothy 3, 4, and 5, I think it states it, states it very well. It says there, he, that is the elder, must be one who manages, one who rules, guides, directs, or leads his own household well. Then it goes on to say, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church of God? So that the right combination of, of oversight and discipline should be seen in the home of the elder. That said, if it, if, it, if it becomes obvious that a man has lost control of his children, they're wild and, and disobedient, well, he is disqualified from being an elder. But it should also be said that suppose an existing elder has lost control of his children, uh, and they, they have become wild in, in their, their living. Well, that elder should step aside from serving the church until the situation in his home has been resolved. And once again, there's a little footnote that goes with this. Just as an elder doesn't need to be married, he doesn't need to have children. That's not a progressive because that he has children. But if he has children, they should be children who are faithful and honor him and his, uh, honor his fa- their father. Okay, so having addressed now, this is the home life of the potential elder. His marriage and family. In verse 7, the focus goes to a series of, of negatives. It says, for the overseer, or again, the, the bishop, must be above reproach as God's steward. Well, the NIV puts it a little bit different. It says, since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. Now, in Paul's day, a, a steward was a slave or a servant entrusted with the authority to manage his master's house. Well, the elder is clearly considered to be God's servant. Uh, He is called to do God's work and is ultimately accountable for the oversight of God's church. Just as a father is the overseer of his own house, so that as also the elder functions as the overseer of God's house. Again, 1 Timothy 3, 4, 3, 4 says, If a man who does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? So a man whose home life is in order, a man who pays his bill, he renders to Caesar what is Caesar, and is above reproach in his dealings with the world, will in all probability be above reproach as an elder in the church. Now, what follows that statement are the traits of a good steward. God's steward must not be self-willed or arrogant or overbearing. So this means means is that elder is not to have his own agenda for the church. Uh, His will must be the will of God as it is revealed in his word. He's not to be a tyrant, uh, flaunting his authority, and once again, Peter, Peter addressed this in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, where, where he says this in verses 2 and 3. Again, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, that's the overseeing, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. And notice, according to the will of God. Well, where do you find the will of God for the church? You find it in God's word. Okay, and not for sort of gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to, to the flock. So the elder must use his authority in a way that promotes God's purposes for the church and not his own. He's not to be a bully, he's not to be a tyrant and beating up the body of Christ, but shepherding the body of Christ as well. Moving on, God's steward must not be quick-tempered or soon angry. So the elder must be able to control his emotions. 
uh, when dealing with issues related to life in the church, uh, especially those that stir up strong feelings uh, among the congregation. Uh, impulsive responses, uh, divisive reactions, they're not a good example to God's flock. And they often create more problems than they solve. Uh, 2 Timothy helps us here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 24 through 26. It says there, the the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. There you have it. Okay, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong. With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may not come to, it may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held a captive by him to do, do his will. will. And so the elders not to be quarrelsome, not, not to be a fighter, not to, not to be quick tempered when it comes to dealing with God's people. Moving on, God's steward must not be addicted to wine uh, or a drunkard. So the elder is to be not not only free from from drunkenness, he's supposed to be free from addiction to alcohol. He's not someone who constantly needs a shot of whiskey or a, a beer to calm his nerves and help him deal with life in his home or in the church. Romans 13, 13 and 14 uh, says this, speaking to all of us, but it certainly applies to the elders in a special way. It says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Beloved, addiction to alcohol can easily lead a man uh, to be unfaithful to his wife, be abusive to his children, selfish, and even lead to him being quick-tempered. So the elder is not to be addicted to wine. He's not to be a drunkard. God's steward must not be pugnacious or violent or striker. He must be not be someone who is a bully, someone who is looking for a fight, someone who is argumentative, uh, someone who actually enjoys fights, uh, getting into arguments with others. Well, this time in Titus, in Titus chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 9 and 11, it, it says this. It says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife, and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So avoid getting involved in in discussions that are are fruitless. Avoid the rising up of this idea of being pugnacious, of being violent or striker. Again, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 20, 21, he says, O Timothy, and this is a plea, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter and opposing arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and has gone astray from the faith. And then he says to Timothy, grace be with you, because you're going to need grace to handle that. And again in 2 Timothy 2, 22 and 23, he wrote, Now flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse, don't get involved with it, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. In Galatians 5, 22, they list outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and and factions among the deeds of the flesh. So the elder must keep his fleshly emotions in check and not lose his temper, even when there may be reason to do so. And then he moves on to say back in Titus again, God's steward must not be fond of sordid gain or greedy for money or given to the filthy lucre. In short, 
The elder should not be in the ministry for the money. He should not consider being an elder a vocation, a job, a, a way to make a living. Being an elder is a calling, and with the calling comes the belief that God will take care of you. Now again, we have to add a little preface here. On the other hand, there must be a connection made between Titus 1.7, not fond of sordid gain, and 1 Timothy 3.3, 3, free from the love of money. There must be a connection between those two statements and 1 Timothy 5.17 and 18, where it says the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who were hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox while he is stressing, and the labor is worthy of his wages. Brothers and sisters, the reason this is important is because there are some things an elder is called to do that you can't pay him enough for doing. There are times when the elder has to do a funeral that is a heart-wrenching funeral that he's been called upon to do. And not only that, on top of that, there are situations in the church that the elder has to deal with that no one else would even want to be involved in. So you see that the church, by taking care of their teaching elder, of the man who labors in the word and doctrine, what they're doing is they're freeing him up for ministry. And they're making it so that he does not have to worry about providing for his wife and family. And in that way, he can devote his time and energy to the study of God's word. Now, true, some men take advantage of the church. And in this sense, that they rob it. Uh, thus, the warning in scripture that God's steward must not be fond of sordid grain, gain, excuse me, or great, greedy for money or given to filthy lucre. Now, in conclusion to all this, one of the greatest comforts that we have as the local body of believers is knowing as Jesus promised in Matthew 16, 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Now, as we've seen this morning, one of the means God uses for building his church is the appointing of godly men to shepherd his flock. You may remember after his resurrection uh, that Jesus uh, told Peter, or, uh, Peter, he said, tend my lambs. And then he said after that, shepherd my sheep. And then he said a second time, tend my lambs. And that word tends, it means uh, to feed the sheep. And it means with particular emphasis on bringing them to green pastures where there's plenty of food for them to graze upon. So elders are to feed Jesus' sheep with good, healthy food harvested from the word of God so that the sheep may grow and mature in the faith. And to be a good feeder, you have to feed yourself, which means the elder is to be a constant student of God's word. Uh, Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Be diligent. Be diligent in this. Take care of this. Pay attention to this. To present yourself to prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. And 1 Timothy 5.17 says, The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double, double honor, especially those who work hard. Where that word can be translated, those who labor at preaching and teaching. The elders should be accustomed to a devouring God's word, not only for his personal spiritual growth, but so that he may be a faithful seller of sound doctrine in the lives of those that he is blessed to serve. Elder should be a man who works up some good sanctified sweat when he's at his study. That he does labor, works hard on trying to understand and interpret God's word accurately. For two reasons, so that God is glorified and God's people are edified. Now, beloved, these are all the, the negative traits of the elder. And I think it's very wise to look at it from the negative side first. 
But what follows is are the positive uh, traits and attributes of an elder, which will encourage us. Because I know going through this list this morning isn't exactly encouraging because you're looking at the negative end of it. But I hope you see the importance that appointing elders is a serious thing that a church does. It should not be taken carefully. It should have been done carefully and with research and a lot of prayer, fasting, and seeking the Lord's will and looking for evidence of the Holy Spirit's guidance within the man as well as those appointing the man. Okay, beloved, so let's take that to heart this morning of this first part, first part of what it means to appoint elders in the church. And in so doing, to get things going in the right direction, as Titus was told to do.